Hey, good morning, Centerpoint. How we doing? Hi, Maddox. Good to see you. Hey, super excited. This is my favorite Sunday of the year. This is awesome. Student Takeover Sunday. We have this saying in CP Youth. It's this, that there is no such thing as a junior Holy Spirit. There's no such thing as a junior Holy Spirit. And our students have the same Holy Spirit that the pastors got, the same Holy Spirit that adults have, and they can walk in their calling and their assignment and, and preach for Jesus. And so we're going to see that. We've already seen it through worship, and you guys are just, I'm so proud. Oh. Um, but we have three amazing uh, communicators, speakers, um, yeah, students that are going to bring the word. Are you guys ready for the word of God this morning? So I, I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready because they, they're bringing it this morning, okay? And it's hard to get up here on this platform. So I just ask that everybody in the room, we celebrate every single student that comes up to share God's, uh, God's heart and God's word. Can we do that together? Yeah? Okay. So first speaker up this morning. Um, she is actually, I've been her leader and pastor uh, since she was in sixth grade, and now she is going into her senior year in high school. She's an absolute light, uh, but she's also just filled with so much wisdom. I've seen her grow so much, and you guys are going to be blessed listening to our first speaker, Ellie Wanger. Give it up for Ellie, everybody. Like Aaron said, uh, my name is Ellie Wenger. I'm going to be a senior at Marietta Valley High School this year, and I'm so ready for what the Lord has planned for us this morning. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you ready? Well, you better be ready because I'm standing here and you're sitting there. So <laughs> anyways, uh, let's just close our eyes and let's pray together before I dive in to the scripture today. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just want to bless over the service today, God. That is, is all under your control and not mine. I want your words to be spoken into each three of the speakers tonight, Lord, and all of his people said, amen. So before we dive in, I'm going to tell you just a little funny story about myself, uh, because that's just something that I, I like to do. <laughs> and um, growing up, I hated the idea of change. I hated things out of my routine. If you're not in my routine, then I'm sorry, but I used to not like you if you didn't fit in my routine. And my routine or my plans soon got ruined in March of 2020. If you remember that, obviously, it flipped all of our worlds upside down. And during this time, you know, I, we, I could say that we all struggled a little bit facing our own challenges in our lives. And then finally, our, my sophomore year of high school at Marietta Valley High School, I finally felt like life was going back to normal. I was finally getting comfortable again. I mean, I had my friends, I loved my teachers, I knew my whereabouts around the school, and then my sister came up to me and asked me the question, Ellie, do you wanna to transfer to Marietta Mesa High School for a junior year? Now I said no, because I loved Marietta Valley. I mean, go Nighthawks, right? <laughs> but in that, <laughs> wow, I see my MV people over here, <laughs> but, I loved my school and obviously I said no, so she kept asking and asking and finally one day I said yes. I don't know why I said yes, but I finally said yes. And then going into this school year, obviously my junior year, it brought a lot of challenges that I faced. I mean, one, I had to grow and I had to see this new environment in my life. I mean, I'm so well known at Marietta Valley High School because everyone just loves a redheaded twin. My all eyes are <laughs> on me. Sadly, and sometimes I don't like it, sometimes I love it. <laughs> and then two, it was the first year, this is going to sound really cringy, that me and my sister actually did not have the same schedules. I have a twin sister, you saw her earlier, she was doing the announcements, she did a great job. <laughs> and, then, and then I was also facing a lot of challenges at home. And I would cry and I would be like, God, why am I facing so many challenges in my life? Well, I recognize that actually God brought breakthrough during this year at Mesa. I mean, I enjoyed Mesa. The teachers, you know, were amazing. I had amazing friends from church that went to that school. And going to Marietta Mesa and facing, you know, all these challenges, like I said, actually brought a lot of breakthrough in my life. One of the things that I realized that I, I realized going to the school is that I no longer had to be dependent on my sister, but be independent and dependent on what the Lord had for my life. So that's kind of the story that I have for you guys today. And today we're going to be reading out of 2 Kings chapter 8. So pull out your Bibles to, or pull out your Bibles or pull out your phone Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 1. And we're currently in this series called Double Up. We're looking at the life of Elijah. 
a prophet with a double portion of the Spirit of God. He is a successor of Elijah's ministry who had the fruit of a double portion spirit. I mean, we can see this through. He's healed leprosy. He's multiplied food. And where we're continuing off today is that he healed a woman's son from the dead. Hopefully you're there at 2 Kings 1, and we're going to read it together. Or more like, I'm going to read it to you, and you're going to read in your head. <laughs> Please don't all read at the same time. <laughs> I'm going to read to you. That's why I have a microphone. <laughs> okay, let's go. Elisha had told the woman whose son has been brought back to life, take your family and move to some other place, for the Lord has called for a famine on Israel that will last for seven years. So the woman did, as the man of God instructed, she took her family and settled in the land of Philistines for seven years. Now this woman had a history with Elijah. We can see in 2 Kings 4 that she offered hospitality to Elijah. She built him a room. We can also see that she was granted a son even though she was told that she was a barren, meaning she couldn't get pregnant. And now her son has been brought back to life. This woman, we don't know her name. They don't ever give her a name in the Bible, but they call her or refer her to as the woman from Shunem. But now she is known by the woman whose son has been brought back to life. She is known no longer by the things of this world, what the world calls her, but now she is known by what God says over her life. In re- Thank you guys. Thanks. <laughs> I, I, heard, I, heard, I heard it come in and then I kept talking. I'm sorry. <laughs> in Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but a free gift of God is eternal through Christ Jesus our Lord. But her challenges don't stop there. They keep going. Then, continuing on, Elijah, Elisha has come and says, take your family and move to some other place because there will be a famine in her land. The challenge is, those, it seems like for her that they just don't stop. They keep coming and coming and coming. I mean, imagine how comfortable this lady was in her town. She probably had her friends. She had her coffee shop. She knew the side roads in her town. She was really comfortable in her position. But now she's being told to move. But she trusted in God's word enough to leave what was comfortable behind and trust in his word. She was able to dictate her life on her obedience in God instead of her own feelings. In Luke 9.23, it says, then he said to the crowd, by the way, it's Jesus talking, sorry. If any of you want to be my followers, you must give up your own ways, take up the cross daily and follow me. And we can see that in this story that this woman, and obviously she must have been kind of, I'm assuming emotional wreck because she just faced so many challenges in her lives, but she does what God instructed. And it kind of goes into a verse that I really want to highlight is 2 Kings chapter 2, or 8, 2, sorry. And it says, so the woman did as a man of God instructed. In remembrance of Abraham, right? Leave your home country and go to the land that I'm telling you. Think about the boldness of this decision to uproot her family and leave upon hearing the word of the Lord. In Isaiah 26, 4, it says, Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is your eternal rock. God should and he needs to be your firm foundation because how can you trust in somebody without knowing somebody? And this woman, we can see in her history that her obedience has always put her in a position to receive blessing. We can see that she was told that she couldn't get pregnant. She got pregnant. We, were, we can see that her son died and then was brought back to life by Elijah. And now we can see that she's gonna have breakthrough when she's moving on to this new town. I mean, you know, if God can lead you to it, he can lead you through it and bring you out of it. And I want you to say that over yourself. I want you to say that out loud to yourself right now. If God can lead you to it, he can lead you through it and bring you out of it. So obviously, it's a lot easier said than done, right? I could talk up here all day about trusting in God, but, you know, we could create many excuses for not listening to the word of God. Doubt could creep in, fear could creep in, but most importantly, I think that we could have a fear of change. We're uncomfortable with the uncomfortable because we don't know whether or not we're going to succeed. We're scared of failure, but let me just tell you this. You're going to face failure in your life. In James 1, 2, it says... Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble of any kind comes your way, consider it an opportunity of great joy. 
God is saying that you will face trouble, but consider it an opportunity for great joy because these trials that you are facing only make you stronger in God. And my second point is fear or doubt from others. People are just so opinionated. They love to say things over your life. I mean, any decision you probably can experience this is that people always want to make comments about your life, whether it's right or it's wrong. And sometimes you just don't know what to do because of what other people are saying. In John 15, 18, it says, if the world hates you, remember it hated me first. We are called to be the light of the world. And we're, if we are the light of this world, of this dark world, then of course people are going to judge us first because we stand out. But I kind of have an easy solution. It's so easy, but yet so hard to grasp. Because here's the rea sorry, my main point, it's gonna be my main point, I was getting a little ahead of myself, is to let go of control. Because here's the reality, if you want to follow God, it is going to require you to let go of the need to be in control, of control. You need to not be sitting in the driver's seat. You need to not be holding on to the wheel or the gas pedal or whatever this thing is. Don't know what it's called. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the thing that puts you in drive to neutral to reverse. I've been driving for two years, okay, and I don't know what it's called. No one ever tells me what it's called, okay? I'm sorry. But sometimes you have to move from the driver's seat even to the pa <laughs> to the passenger seat. And sometimes God will even put you in the back seat because we can be annoying sometimes. <laughs> we have to, but we're going to see later on in the story that the opposite of control is trust. In Proverbs 3, 5, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. God is saying in the scripture, depend on the Lord with all your heart, not half of your heart or one fourth of your heart or depend on God halfway and yourself halfway. No, he is saying depend on God. Depend on him because he's gonna bring breakthrough in your life. So and then, and then another thing is that we have to check the history. This woman had a history with Elijah this godly man. She had a history of seeing breakthrough in her life. I'm gonna go through it one more time. She got pregnant even though she was told that she couldn't get pregnant. Her son was brought back to life even when, her son was brought back to life after he died and now she's being called to leave what is comfortable behind her hometown. But we gotta realize that her obedience has always put her in a position to receive blessing. So what happens when we put our trust in God? What changes in our lives? Well, simply this, we get to live in freedom and in peace. Amen. We no longer have to be chained up to the world, but we get to live in the freedom of God. Amen. In Isaiah 26, three, it says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. You're gonna face challenges in this life, and I hope that... Um, you're going to face challenges in this life, and I hope that your eyes are fixed on Jesus because God does not guarantee an easy life. Because if you want to see change, there has to be change in your life. Well, that is all that I kind of have for you guys today. Thank you for listening, and yeah. So good. Come on, isn't that so good? I can't believe it. Amazing. Uh, so I'm super excited to introduce our next speaker. I have also been able, had the privilege to be a leader and pastor for her, I, I think since sixth grade, eighth grade, something like that. Fourth grade? Eighth grade. Okay. I'm like, what? I'm not even the kids director. How is that possible? That's crazy. That's awesome. Um, she actually just graduated high school and she's heading to UCLA. Okay. She's heading to UCLA in the fall. Absolutely wicked smart, but has an amazing passion for Jesus, and you guys are going to be blessed. Give it up for Maddie Clark as she comes to give the word. Sorry, one second. <laughs> okay, what's up, 11 o'clock? Woo, how are you guys doing? Good? All right, well, um, like he said, my name is Maddie. Um, I graduated out of the youth program, I'm going to be heading off to college in the fall, but, um, and probably around 
this time last year you saw me playing keys, but I'm actually super excited to be here right now to actually share what God's put on my heart. And I don't know about you, I'm ready. I, I got my blazer, I got, I got my fresh kicks. We're ready to go, all right? But I do have limited time and probably too much to say, so we're gonna get right into it. But I'm a girl who loves a good adventure, and a few years back, my family and I, we went up north to um, uh, just a little getaway trip. My aunt and uncle, they're awesome. They had this beautiful cabin up near Lake Almanar, um, and it was an awesome time with family. But my favorite part of the trip was when we went on the lake and we were doing lake activities. And we had this speedboat of sorts and then um, this like circular tube that you attach to the boat by rope and the boat would like pull the tube. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. So. I was initially a little nervous, a little nervy to get on that thing because one, I've seen the videos of people flying off and also there was a fire nearby the whole time we were there so it made everything smoky but the lake like just had like this ominous like sense to it and I don't know, I, I was getting in my head but I got beside myself, my sister and I, we hop on, my uncle's driving, he, he whirs up the boat, we start going and I'm like this isn't even that bad but of course he's going at reduced speed in a straight line. And it was almost as if, just when I was thinking that, he, he decided to turn up the speed and now he's turning the boat and we start skidding across the water. And he's turning it the other way and we're ripping through the water at crazy speed. And at one point I was holding on for dear life and my body was not even on the raft anymore. I was just being dragged <laughs> by the water. And my sister, she looks over out of concern and she says, hold on. And I was like, what do you think I'm doing? <laughs> it was crazy, crazy but fun until I did, however, hit that wave that sent me flying and I got proof. <laughs> Tragic. But I can tell you, in this situation, I felt extremely out of control. I was at the mercy of my uncle driving and maybe in this situation, it would have been nice to have some control. It would have been nice to know which way we were going, but when it comes to my spiritual life, that is actually one place I want to let go of control because then I'm able to see who is in control. And see, God, God is supreme overall. We call him sovereign. And when I'm able to let go of control in my life, I'm able to be in a place where I can stand in awe as I see his miraculous power demonstrated in my life as he works in ways only he can. And so, we're going to see this in this passage. We're going to be continuing in 2 Kings um, chapter 8, starting in verse 3. And it says this. After the famine ended, she returned from the land of the Philistines. And she went to see the king about getting back her house and land. As she came in, the king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God. The king had just said, tell me some stories about the great things Elisha has done. And Gehazi was telling the king about the time Elisha had brought a boy back to life. At that very moment, the mother of the boy walked in to make her appeal to the king about her house and land. Look, my lord, the king, Gehazi exclaimed, here is the woman now, and this is her son, the very one Elijah brought back to life. Okay, so let's break it down because, because you might miss it. So this famine ends, right, and this woman goes back to Israel to appeal for her house and land. She goes to see the king, and as she's walking in, the king is talking with Gehazi, about her and her son, and she actually goes with her son, so the king's able to witness that said child is alive. And maybe there's more significance to this story than we see at surface level, but to understand the scope of this story is to go back to that woman's first act of hospitality. Because where she was there to the position she is in now, that's nothing short of God working by, behind the scenes. And we see both the wisdom and the sovereignty of God at play. So track with me, okay? This woman, she opens up her house to Elisha, we know that. But one of the reasons she's likely able to do this is because she had no children. And then she's blessed with a child. That child gets sick and dies. That, whoa, gets sick and dies. Yeah, okay. Then is resurrected. Um, and then throughout this, she has built a relationship with Elisha, which puts her in a position to know things she wouldn't otherwise know. This allows her to flee a famine and find refuge for seven years. And she returns back to get her house and land back. And she goes to see the king. 
And the king is talking to Gehazi, a servant of the man she had helped and a witness to the miracle. And they're talking about her. And Gehazi, among all, all the stories he could have told, all the ways God worked through Elisha, because we know there's a lot, he's talking about that very woman's story. Get this to the very person that actually had the power to bring about what she was looking for. And the king, as the story is being told, sees the risen child right in front of his eyes, which inclines him to, as you learn in the next verse, Oh gosh, I'm running out of breath, okay. <laughs> Actually restore what was lost, something due to his history, due to his track record, he probably would have never done if he hadn't seen God's miraculous power right in front of him. So this woman receives years of blessing and provision because of her obedience and trust. And I look at this, this timeline, this series of events, and I say, that can only be God. Right. But we want to paint it as a coincidence. You know, things just happen at the right time. But we do this in our own life because what we call random is really right on time for God. Right. What we call a mystery is really the maker of the heavens and the earth doing what he does best. What we call happenstance is really the hand of God working. And what we even call serendipity is really the sovereignty of God. Yeah. Let's call it what it is. It didn't just so happen. It was just my God. It's not twisted. That business deal that went through at just the right time or that pivotal conversation you had that's put you in the position you are in now, that's nothing short of God working behind the scenes. On your behalf. It, we, we say, oh, oh, things just panned out. I guess luck just must be on my side. No, 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 sister. <laughs> God is on your side. And let's not rob him of the glory he deserves. He is weaving together a picture in your life that you can't even begin to comprehend, even if you try. He's putting the pieces together here and there. He's the author writing your story. And I love what Habakkuk 1.5 says. It says, the Lord replied, look around at the nations. Look and be amazed, for I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't even believe even if someone told you about it. I love that. Look and be amazed. Be amazed. Be in awe. Be in reverence. I feel that is the only appropriate response to the kind of sovereignty and power that our God has. And Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, it goes on to talk about how God's ways are higher than our ways and how his thoughts are, high, whoa, are higher than our thoughts. And we know this is true. We, we've heard it before. We have limited human understanding. What does Proverbs tell us? She just went over it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Participate. Okay, we're going to try that again. That's just not. <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all your heart and what? Why? Because we have limits to our understanding. We cannot fully comprehend the absolute and supernatural nature of our God. And I was thinking about this because I'm a bit of a science nerd. And when you get down and study, it is remarkable how God created us. And just for example, how our organs have specialized functions, but yet they all work together and how he intricated us down to the very last detail. Uh, but what is even more amazing is our human brain and the things it can do. It's amazing, but I have to wonder, if we're made in the likeness of God, why do we have lack? Why, why do we lack the faculties and capacities to actually fully understand the miraculous ways in which he works? But then the wheels start turning because our human tendency, if we had all the answers, we wouldn't trust him every step of the way. We would come to a place where we think we don't need God, and the moment we as a people think we don't need God is the moment we have lost our way. That's right. That's right. I thank God. I thank God that in my life, how he made things work, how that closed door actually turned out for my better, it makes absolutely no sense, but I thank him because why? It's just another reminder that God is God, and I'm not. That's right. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> but the problem, get ready, because you might step on some toes. The problem is that we try to be the masters of our own stories far too often. 
hear me when I say this. It's a scary place to be when you think you can do what only God can do. We like to take matters in our own hands and we don't rely on God. Imagine if this woman had taken matters into her own hands. Seven years? I'm not waiting seven years. I'll just march on up there and demand they give my land back. It's mine after all. See, but if she had come any earlier, she would have missed this series of events that led to the complete restoration of what she had lost. Because when we operate from control... We can actually mess up the timing or not be where God actually wants us to be. But when we obey him, when we trust his leading, we find ourselves in the right place at the right time. But yet we want to use our own understanding. We we know it has limits to it and we serve a God who knows it all. It's like using a bucket you know has holes in it. Why why do we do it? So church, can we let God be God? Can can we trust in the ever-present, all-powerful God? It's a bit cliche, but I'm going to say it anyways. We need to let go and let God. Let go and let God. Why? Because he's sovereign. Do you understand what I'm saying when I say he's sovereign? It's understanding that nothing in all the vast universe can come to pass otherwise than what God has eternally purposed. And I don't know about you, but I find a sense of peace in knowing that my life is in his hands. The one who reigns above it all, king of kings and lord of lords. Yeah, we choose control. And trust me, I've been there. I... I wanted to control my future so bad, but I began to see God working in ways I quite literally could not even imagine. He, he, it wasn't even on my radar, whoa, radar, radar, there we go. Um, he was putting pieces together here and there, and I don't have time to go into depth, but if you see me, pull me aside, because I'd love to share all about it, because I think God deserves all the glory, as he does in your life, too. And so I hope if nothing else, today I was able to encourage you that God's got you. But also, if you were able to see just a glimpse of the magnitude of the power that our God has, maybe letting go of control might become that much easier. And so I want to jump to Psalm 71, 16 through 19. I love this passage. It says this. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds, yours alone. Since my youth, God, you have taught me. And to this day, I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. You who have done great things. Say this last part with me. Who is like you, God? Who is like you, God? Amen. Well, unfortunately, this is the time where I have to say peace out, but it's been an honor. I love y'all. Hope you got something out of it. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Can we give it up one more time for Maddie? So good. I don't know if it was the blazer, but I feel convicted. I feel convicted. Did anyone else feel convicted? I'm like, why am I trusting so much in myself? This is so bad. Okay. So good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So last but not least, um, our final student, I'm excited to invite him up. Um, every once in a while, you get a student in youth group that is, um, he's so intelligent that uh, he makes me have to research things so I can answer his questions. <laughs> Uh, and he stumps me all the time. Uh, he's got an amazing, brilliant mind on him, but he's also got a tender heart before the Lord, and I know uh, he's going to close us up, uh, finish this up. So give it up for Oscar Chavez, everybody, as he comes up to speak tonight. Hello, hello. Hi. Welcome, everybody, here to Center Point Church. My name is Oscar. I am going into my senior year, at, so I'm just trying to fix all these papers up here. I'm going to my senior year at Marietta Mesa High School. And that being said, yeah, oh man. Uh, That being said, uh, I'm just going to open up with some quick prayer and we're just going to get right into it, okay? All right. Yeah, if you could just actually just take off your hats, bow your heads. Um, Awesome. Thank you. 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you so much for uh, giving, giving everyone here at the 5 o'clock service this amazing opportunity to, to come together as a congregation and, and just listen to your word, God. I thank you for, for giving me the amazing opportunity to, to be the one to, to share and spread your word, Lord God. I pray that you bless my tongue and, and you bless their ears and their hearts, Lord, and everything that is said today perfectly aligns with your will, and I pray that people leave here changed, and uh, including myself, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, all right, we're all prayed up. I feel good now, guys. Okay, now I'm going to start off a super serious question. Uh, every service, I've literally been asking this question, and it's only been you know, very positive answers. But how many of you guys, feel free to like raise your hands and nod your heads. How many of you guys have ever seen the show Fixer Upper? Okay. Oh, man. Okay, so we're three for three right now. I'm feeling really good about that. So the show Fixer Upper, if you've never seen it before, it's a show where the super awesome married couple, Chip and Joanna Gaines, they go out and they buy deteriorating houses. Now what they do with these houses is they buy them, they fix them up, and then they sell the house for a profit. Now, the only reason, oh, I'm going to adjust that. I like looking directly. There we go. The only reason why I'm bringing this up right now is because it helps me paint a pretty clear picture in everyone's heads here of what restoration looks like, right? Because restoration, if you take a step back here, that's largely what, well, not just restoration, but this story, it's a story of restoration through faith, right? And there is a difference there because we can find restoration or a, a, maybe a sense of it anyway. In, in things like a vacation or a cup of coffee, right? Some, you might find it in your, your husband, your wife, or maybe even your parents. You can be restored with your parents. But these things that, that I just said, they're, they're very, they're limited, right? They're finite. And if you put your identity of restoration in something that's, that's limited, in return, you're, you're going to get limited restoration, and that's where restoration through faith, it, it's something that's completely different, right? Because we're getting, we're putting our faith in something that's infinite. We're putting our faith in the infinite. And in return, we get infinite restoration. Does that make sense? Okay, we're following so far. I see the, the head's nodding, loving it. Okay, now, I'm, I know we've been talking about the same story for the past, like, 20 minutes. But if you allow me, I'm just going to run through it, like, super quickly one more time. And hopefully what we can do here is we can uh, sort of get my points and the points of the previous two speakers and sort of try to um, make one cohesive message. Is that okay? All right, cool. Love the enthusiasm, guys. So uh, that being said, I'm going to jump right into it. So we see in verse 1 that Elisha tells the woman that there is going to be a seven-year famine in Israel. Now, in the Bible, if you didn't know this, in the Bible, the number seven is typically used to represent a time of fullness and completion. So now when we, if you read that in context, we understand that Israel is going under a full seven-year full and complete famine. Does that make sense? I want you to remember that. So the number seven means full and complete. It's going to be very important for my future points. So next thing we can notice here too in verse one is that Elijah doesn't actually tell the woman anything other than get your family and leave, right? And that's, in doing so, right, by leaving her country and only taking her family with her, she's retroactively also discarding all of her wealth. And she was a wealthy woman at the time, right? It's actually uh, sort of a key part of the story here. Her, her wealth is supposed to signify how great of a transition this is in her life. And then on top of that, we also can notice that he doesn't tell her where to go, really what to do or who to talk to, right? And that's only going to add on to the insecurity that she's feeling in the situation. Because now not only is she poor, she only has her family. She doesn't know where to go. And, and she, she's really not too sure of what her next step is. Now in verse 2, we actually find out that she decides to move in to the, uh, the land of the Philistines, right? Now, the land of the Philistines, at the time, they did not like Jewish people very much. Now, as a Jewish woman, you could probably, you know, maybe see how that might have affected her day-to-day -day life just a little bit, right? And so that's, I, I'm just going to do a quick, let's do a recap, actually. Yeah, I'm going to run through a recap. So we have her wealth. Oh, actually, no, 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 sorry, I almost forgot the debatably most important thing. I can't believe I almost skipped over this, but last thing uh, that she, she might have gone through during the seven-year period, and I do want to emphasize might because we don't know this part for sure, but we can assume based on the context given to us in, in Scripture that somewhere along the seven-year period, her husband actually might have passed away, right? Because we see in 2 Kings chapter 4 that he was so old, it was actually part of the reason that she wasn't able to have kids, right? Because he was old. And on top of that, we see that at the end of the story, 
the woman is the one who goes and approaches the king and tries to sort of negotiate for her property back. Now, that's pretty uncharacteristic for the time, right? Because as the head of the household, the man is typically the one who would have gone to the king and maybe tried to, to strike up a deal with them. But he, it actually, it sounds like he wasn't even in the room. We know the woman was in the room. We know the king and Gehazi were in the room. We even know her son was in the room. But there's no mention of, of her husband at all. Now, let, this is where we get the recap. So I, let, let's sort of look over what we just talked about. So her wealth is gone. Her home is gone. She is facing heavy discrimination every single day. And on top of that, there's a, a very real possibility that she also might have lost her husband. This is not a good situation to be in. And in fact, if most of us were in this situation, we probably would have said that our lives were ruined. Now, I, I want to, um, that being said, right, we kind of know where she is now. And I'm just going to read the last verse of the story. It's going to be 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 6. And, and this is what it says. So is this true? The king asked her, and she told him the story. So he directed one of his officials to see that everything she had lost was restored to her, including the value of any crops that had been harvested during her absence. So I just wanted to take a super, super brief moment here. I wanted to take a super brief moment to just really look at the, the king's generosity here. Because, well, let's put this in a modern context really quick, right? Imagine if you, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. What, imagine if you left the country your home country, for seven years. And in doing so, you completely leave all of your wealth behind, right? So you're not paying property taxes anymore. And by all means, you've basically cut ties with your country. Now, on top of that, while you're gone, your country has the most intense Great Depression that it's seen in a very long time. Anyway, seven years end, and you end up going back. And not only do you decide to live back in your country, but you have the audacity to go back to the president, knock on his door and go, hey, bud, yeah, 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 I knew there was a famine. Can you believe that? That was crazy. Can you give me my home back? And he did it. He actually did it because he thought her story was cool. That's insane. Not only did he give her her home back, but he also, he gave her seven-year annual salary of what she would have made if she actually stayed. This right here, I, this is nothing short of a miracle, and I, I wanted to emphasize that, right? And it's only meant to really highlight how incredible of a, of a restoration story this is. Right, what she lost, and then not only what she got back, but what she gained, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, another thing, another thing I, I want to look at here is, is what this woman went through. I know we just went through the recap, right? Discrimination, home, wealth, all the fun stuff. But I, I really want to highlight that although, although this woman didn't have to go through the seven-year full and complete famine that Israel went through, right, which was definitely worse, she, she still had to go through an immense, uh, an incredibly hard and f painful, full and complete season of, of suffering and anxiety and fear. But it's through that full and complete season of pain that by the end of the story, she is allowed to, to enter in full and complete restoration. Now, that being said, I... Thank you. <laughs> uh, that being said, I... I, I also want to highlight the fact that she did go through immense suffering, and it, it was very painful for her, but she, she was still saved from the, the complete famine that Israel went through. And there's actually something I want to read to you guys really quick. It's going to be uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. I'm reading NLT, if that changes your worldview at all. All right, so it says this. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Now, I want to take a quick moment to, to notice the word endure there, right? It uses the word endure. And... I, 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 that's pretty significant, especially in, in this scripture here, because, I mean, you don't typically endure things that you enjoy, right? You, you endure things that are hard, things that you want to quit. You, you endure things that, that, are, that are painful, things that are tragic. You endure those things. Now, a, a lot of people have, they have this idea that um, they, they, they view Christianity as more of a karma system, Right? I become a Christian and all my problems are going to go away. 
That's the big one. Or debatably, the biggest one is I'm a Christian, meaning I'm a good person. And because I'm a good person, God in return has to make good things happen to me. And they, they allow this way of thinking to, in a sense, pollute their relationship with, with Christ. Because not only is this uh, almost coming from a, a sense of entitlement, but this also completely erases any significance and any future glory that comes from these times of endurance. Now, I wrestled for two years. I wrestled for two years at Marietta Mesa High School. I absolutely loved it. It was super, super hard. Um, actually, well, you could argue that I hated it, but I also loved it at the same time. Super weird. You, you can probably under, only understand if you wrestled, but if you ever, ever played a sport before, then you know that there is a level of, of endurance there. And I'm not talking about physical endurance. I'm talking about, like, there's a, there's a mental barrier that can, you have to go through, Right? Because I'm sure while, while you're running, right, while, while you're doing your miles, you're probably not thinking, wow, I'm having the time of my life right now. <laughs> Dude, I got to do this more often. No, you hate it, right? It sucks, right? It's painful, but that, that, that's, that's the point. It's supposed to be painful. Because through that pain, through that pain, you're allowed to, to actually test the limits of what you could do and, and the thing that you truly enjoy. And... I think, I think, once again, back to those people who, who go back, back to the karma system, right? These things that they, this train of thought, I think could almost be completely done away with. Because the pain that we experience, and I, I recognize that I'm sure there's people in here that are going through pain right now. The pain that we experience is, I want to be very careful with my words here, guys. It, it's a lot easier to fight the battle of endurance when you know why you're fighting for it. I want to read something super, super quick. It's going to be Romans chapter, chapter 5. Uh, it's going to be Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. So this is what it says. We can rejoice too when you run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. Notice the word endurance there again. Different, different book entirely. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how clearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly hopeless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, remember, right, we, we have to keep in mind what we're fighting for, right? It, it's very hard to have endurance Right? It's hard to run a race with no, with no goalpost, right? Because it's super easy to quit at any time. And in fact, I mean, it really doesn't matter time. It doesn't matter if you quit at all, right? Because if there's no goalpost, then really there's, there's no sense of achievement. There's no accomplishment there, right? And you're just going to be running for the rest of your life. Now, so I got to look at my notes here one more time. I, I, I want to notice that our reward a reward for having endurance, it's not only to, to refine our, our faith, right, to, to make it more genuine, more pure, and it's not only to help develop our character as Christians, but it's also to, to further magnify the glory of, of the restoration that we will one day receive. Once again, you go back to what this woman went through. What this woman went through, it was hard, but the whole point of the story is that it was hard, it was hard, but she, she was allowed to, because of her endurance, because of her, her genuine faith, she was allowed to enter the restoration that God had already planned for her. Now, uh, going back to, to 1 Peter chapter 1, I read it already, and I'm just going to skim ahead a little bit to chapter 9. This is what it says. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. I mean, that, that and alone, it, it's, it's a pretty intense thing, and a lot of people, when they, when they hear the word restoration, they think of, they think of wealth or, or monetary things. And even a step back from that, it could be something, maybe, a, quote, a little better, right? It could be things like health and, or even happiness. And, and these are all good things to, to want, right? I'm not saying that these things are evil by any means. But what I'm saying is they shouldn't be the foundation of, of what we're striving for. These shouldn't be the goalposts that we're, we're chasing to with our endurance. Does that make sense? Okay, glad, glad we're all following along here. Now, 
I, I want to I wanna emphasize that or maybe acknowledge that, you know, once again, there are people in here that are going through some pretty hard times. And I, I I'm incredibly blessed and I, I do want to recognize that as, you know, as someone who really has, hasn't had any sort of genuine adversity in their life, right? I'm only 17 years old. So at the end of the day, what do I know? But at the same time, it, it's still very easy for me to point to scripture and say, everything you're going through right now does have a purpose. And I, I'm sure it's painful, but it's good. It's really good. Now, I, I know that there's a lot of unbelievers in this room. And that's, I, I don't know what the reason for that is. I know I had my own reasons before for, for not really believing. And I know that there's a lot of trickery out there, right? There's a lot of, a lot of fools, a lot of false teachers. But I, I just want to say right now, I, I'm coming from a, a place of, genuine sincerity yeah worship team can come up thank you <laughs> I always forget to, to invite them up here but I I, I just I, I can attest for for what Jesus has done to, to my own life and what he continues to do in my life and the, the transformation that I, I'm currently going through it's something that I'm as of right now it's, it's going pretty good but I mean it, come a time where, where something serious does happen I, I'm glad that I at least have something that is infinite to, to fall back on. Something that is beyond my place as a temporary resident of this world. That being said, um, I do want to give anyone in here the, the opportunity, if, if you haven't already, to enter one day in that full restoration. And I, I'm sure you've had the opportunity to before. I'd argue... Maybe that, you know, everyone in here has. But I would also argue that a lot of people in here haven't fully seized that opportunity to enter not only in, in a relationship with God, but to, I mean, once again, quoting First Peter, but to one day share in that glory, the glory of, of the pain that you're currently going through, to one day triumph over that and say, I did that for my God. So if we could all bow our heads. Thank you so much. Actually, remove our hats too. I'm, I'm so sorry. That'd be awesome. I, but I, I know I just said this. So there are a lot of unbelievers in this room and I hope that, I hope that maybe something that was said today can, can help change your life. And if you do, once again, want to enter in that restoration, it's super simple. The greatest gift that we can ever receive can be attained just by saying I'm sorry and I want to give you the opportunity to, to do that right now just say God I'm I'm sorry I'm sorry for being a sinner and I, I know that's exactly what I am but through the, the precious blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ I know that I can be purified in your name and maybe if you, if you do believe right here if, if you do feel that you have a, a strong relationship with God, I want you to just pray for those around you who maybe don't. If you, um, if you do, if you feel confident, and I know this is a big ask, but if you, do feel, if you do feel confident in entering in that faith, if you could just feel comfortable raising your hand, uh, we, we would love to run maybe a Bible over to you and maybe just get you connected with the church and, and just spread the good news to you and, and what what God has, has done, not only in our lives, but what he could do to yours. Right, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna open up, or close, I should say. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open up a prayer to close the service. There we go, that's what I meant to say. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you so much for the amazing blessings, God, that you have given every single person in this room, whether we recognize it or not, Lord. God, I, I, wanna, I wanna thank you for all the things that I'm not smart enough to thank you for, God. And I, I want to recognize how thankful we all are to, to be in, in this position, in a comfortable room with air conditioning. Thank you, God, for allowing all of us to, to step in this day of restoration one day, Lord. And, and maybe not everyone will accept it, Lord God, but at the very least, thank you for, for allowing us to, to even hear the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that those who came here today
maybe unsure or maybe just outright in disbelief, Lord. I pray that you you allow them to walk away completely changed. Or if not that, Lord, at the very least, I, I pray that you allow something that was said today to just get the gears turning and, and to maybe form one tiny crack in a hardened heart, Lord. Thank you for all that you've done. And I, I wanna thank you for all that you will continue to do and, until the day where you arrive as, a, as the day of restoration, as the day of rejuvenation for all the, all the Christians in the world, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, thank you for joining us for this week's message. I hope that you heard from Jesus and you walk away transformed and changed. If you want to connect with us or you'd like to give to this ministry, go ahead and check out our website, mycenterpoint.tv. We'll see you here next time. Don't forget to click subscribe.